so my first question to you is, at the moment we have a very challenging economic situation in the world, especially following a Brexit, and uh, we have uh, such huge drops in the recent um, times. What is actually happening with our economic situation at the moment in the world? I think right now, as a result of Brexit, we're seeing increased volatility as markets adjust to a perceived new reality in Europe. Markets factored in some of that risk before the Brexit vote, but with the UK supposedly leaving the European Union, and we still have to see the British uh, invoke Article 5 to actually formally start the process, a lot of countries around the world are wondering what's going to happen to the English financial system. That is implication for large financial institutions, large investment banks like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, HSBC and others that have been headquartered in London as the focus of their European business, most likely they may have to leave London. It just doesn't make sense anymore to do business from London on the European continent. We're also seeing a lot of, or probably will see a lot of migration flows from London. There were a lot of EU citizens working in London on EU passports who, if England leaves the European Union, will no longer be able to work there. So there's a lot of volatility, there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's taking shape in a lot of volatility in markets. In the past few days, we've seen that calming a little bit, but I anticipate that that will continue going forward. If we look at the moment what's happening with um, England, and let's put it in a, in a situation like this, uh, what's going to happen if um, they revoke um, Article 50 with uh, Europe, but one effect that will have on uh, North American markets and mm -hmm. um, Russia and China, which are playing at the moment games between each other all the times. Yes, I think that there's an economic aspect of that and a financial sector aspect, and there's also a geopolitical aspect. I think that Russia, a country that I visited many times, and I know that has a long history in Bosnia as well, Russia's hoping that the UK will separate for the, from the European Union because Russia's hoping for a weaker EU. And Russia sees the disintegration of the EU in its interest. So Russia gets stronger, the EU as an entity gets weaker. That's a Cold War mentality that the rest of the world has moved beyond. Russia has not. I think China's really just interested in finding places for investment and finding buyers for its goods. So a weaker EU economy is not really in China's interest because it still needs to sell its goods abroad. So I think it's a bit of a mixed bag, but very clear on the Russia angle. Let's move to the other important um, region in the world. Then you have a large experience there. That's the Middle East. Yes. And in the Middle East, we have now a situation that we have an um, unstable Iraq. We have yes. Syria. We have uh, Turkey. We have uh, migration crisis. We also have uh, political turmoil mm -hmm. in all those um, countries. How that situation will play out in the next um, period? What's going to happen um, over there? I think anybody that tells you that they know what's going to happen is lying and shouldn't be trusted because I think that there are a lot of unknown variables. I spent the first part of my career working in Iraq where ethnic tensions and sectarian warfare really dominated the country and unfortunately are still at play in all of the places that you mentioned. I think that the best thing that we can hope for is that political processes towards reconciliation get underway. Again, an issue I know that your country is very familiar with, but if everything goes on a positive trajectory, we'll see some sort of discussion between pro-regime forces and quote-unquote rebels in Syria. I think as Russia pulls back support for Assad, that's more likely. I think in Iraq, hopefully, the military conflict is trending uh, more towards stability as key cities like Fallujah are taken over. But then the hard work starts. And as the United States has learned across the Middle East, peace is perhaps harder than war and takes many, many years and perhaps decades to take hold. So I think it really remains to be seen. And I think that the economic aspect of this can't be forgotten. I think that as political reform is undertaken, economic reform has to go hand in hand. And that's something that uh, you know Bosnia is probably well aware of. We need to see a vibrant economy flourish so that people have a stake in the political success of their country. Another very troubling issue, especially for, for um, this part of the world and the Middle East, is the terrorism. Yes. And we have a situation there that between 150 and 400 people from Bosnia have went to fight um, there. And the United States is a leading um, country now when it mm -hmm. comes to fight against terrorism. How we can actually fight against um, terrorism and especially how we can fight against recruitment 
um, people who are going now to Iraq, Syria, um, and even doing terrorist attacks here in Europe? I think that there are two things that have to be done, and they have to be done at the same time. I think that there is a logistical effort that has to be underway in terms of stopping the communication of terrorist groups from disenfranchised people in various countries, whether it be Bosnia or the United States. And that's an effort that needs to be underway with the private sector on the communication front, on the digital front, and shutting down those avenues of communication. But we also have to look at the longer term problem of countering violent extremism. And it's a fact that terrorists come from wealthy groups and they come from poor groups. What we're seeing a lot now, particularly with um, incidences that have happened in Western Europe and in the US, is disenfranchised youth calling themselves terrorists and being inspired by terrorist groups. And that's a function of youth unemployment. I believe it's 60% in your country. Poor education, poor access to jobs, and really no hope for a better future. And so it's incumbent upon governments and the private sector to improve that economic situation so that there are more avenues for expression other than joining a terrorist fight that perhaps isn't even directly relevant to what our youth are facing at home. Um, we recently have here a um, visit to Bosnia by uh, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, John Brennan, and everybody has asked only one question, mm -hmm. why he is coming here? From your own experience, what for one country means when the director of CIA comes but doesn't say anything publicly, what are the reasons for his visit? And especially he comes to a small country like Bosnia on an announced um, visit. Uh, well, I won't comment on intelligence matters anymore uh, or at all because uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. But I will say that the United States government and the Central Intelligence Agency has very important intelligence sharing relationships around the world with a whole lot of countries. And Bosnia is, as you mentioned, home to many foreign fighters and really at the nexus of um, some key migration issues and flows to and from the Middle East. So I would imagine that if Director Brennan came, it was to talk about bolstering those intelligence sharing relationships to achieve a common objective, which I'm guessing in this case is stopping the flow of foreign fighters. So cooperation between countries, especially with United States and other Western mm -hmm. uh, European countries, should be our way in fight against uh, terrorism here. I think it has here. to be. I think it has to be. This is a global problem. Nothing that happens in Bosnia is contained to Bosnia. It has global ramifications. And the Bosnian government and the U.S. government, as well as many others, are really seeking to stem the flow of foreign fighters and to stop the flow of violence. We've had too many people die around the world already as a result of terrorist actions. And both governments can take real steps separately and together to stop that from happening again. Um, and my last question is, um, we have this migrant crisis which has not been seen since um, end of Second World War. Yes. And probably it's bigger than um, any um, other. Um, is there a way to prevent this to happen sometimes in the future as it's happening now, it doesn't matter in which part of the world. And we know that the migrants at this moment are coming from uh, waste areas of the world from several different con continents. I think unfortunately, as is often the case in war, hindsight is 2020. And if the conditions in Syria hadn't deteriorated to the point that they had, we wouldn't have this crisis. And if you, the international community does not allow conditions like this to exist again somewhere else, we won't be dealt with the same issue. But I'm personally a, a function of the migrant crisis as a result of World War II. My family fled uh, the Holocaust in Europe because the conditions were so unviable, and that's the same thing in Syria. So we can just hope for that there won't be another war or genocide of this nature anytime soon.